Hello, today is November 3rd, 2011. We're meeting today with Mr. Theodore Waller at his home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Ted, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Well, thank you very much thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. All right, I was born in Buffalo, New York, and uh, July 11th, 1924. And uh, we lived, uh, I lived in Buffalo right up until the time I went into the service. Mm -hmm. And uh, rather an uneventful childhood, I, I did go to all Catholic schools. Uh, the, uh, I started out, well, there's one little fact about my schooling that might be amusing. I uh, went with my mother to enroll my older brother who was 16 years, uh, 16 months older than I. And how many brothers and sisters did you have? Oh, I'm sorry. I had, uh, I had three brothers and, uh, and no sisters. And you were the middle one? I was the uh, second oldest. Okay. And uh, anyway, uh, my brother, when my brother started school, my mother took me along to the good nuns uh, at uh, St. Francis de Sales School. And I was four years old, and uh, I put up such a fuss with him going to school that the sister relented and let me start school at the same time. <laughs> so I started school early, and therefore I finished uh, my high school at age 16. Oh, wow. So. Uh, that's a little, uh, there one other little uh, aside involved in, involving that, and that was that my, my brother was a much better student than I was. And I was sort of, a, well, maybe opportunistic for as much as being lazy. But anyway, he would do the homework, and we were in the same class, and uh, uh, I'd wait until he finished his homework and went out to do something else and I'd sneak in and get his homework and I'd copy his homework. And what really upset him is that I got better grades than he did because I, all I did is copy and my penmanship was very good that way, you know. So uh, he finally, in the fifth or fourth or fifth grade, he asked to be uh, uh, set back a year. He just didn't want to face that any longer. So he graduated a year later than I did. And uh, <laughs> I've always felt a little bad about that. <laughs> and we've kidded about it many times since. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I went through uh, St. Francis uh, through the sixth grade, then Mount St. Joseph's. And so I had the good nuns for eight years. And then I went to uh, uh, Canisius, uh, to St. No. Let me see, uh, Mount St. Joseph. High school, I went uh, to uh, St. Joe's, which was the uh, Christian Brothers. So I had the good nuns for eight years, the Christian Brothers for four, and then I wound up going to Canisius College for two years and to Marquette University for two, and they were both, they were all Jes Jesuits, so I had a total uh, package there. And uh, it, it, to me, it was always, I was always grateful to my folks for doing that because the, the nuns were, you know, pretty, pretty much di disciplinarians. And the Christian brothers kind of took a, a little bit of slant on that. They, uh, they were sort of uh, stood toe to toe with you. And, and, and many of the students, we had, as you know, would be teenagers and they'd be smarting off. And, and one of the Christian brothers would invite him to the gym after school for a little boxing practice. And, and then and the Jesuits were, of course, quite intellectual and uh, challenging in that way. So I don't, I think that's about all I can say about my... Well, uh, before we jump into your military experience, one question I always like to ask uh, people from your generation, was your family much affected by the Great Depression? Uh, yes and no. Uh, the uh, my dad worked for my 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 grandfather, uh, my uh, my mother's father, who had a brewery in Buffalo, Stein's Brewing Company, and they, he came over here. He got his uh, brewmaster's uh, license in Germany, and came over here and uh, 
As a matter of fact, the story goes that when he arrived in Buffalo, he couldn't pay the, he got beat up by the cab driver because he didn't have quite enough money to pay the cab driver. So he went from there to a multi-million dollar brewing business. And uh, the, the, the thing was that all my uncles, of course, were college educated. And my father had sixth grade education. So that was always been a, a, a little, little uh, situation that we had to live with in our family because, uh, of course, being biased, I, we always felt that my uncles were less than totally uh, kind to my father because they, they felt, you know, he was uneducated and so forth and so on. But it wasn't all that bad, and uh, I can hear my mother saying, even to this day, uh, anytime there'd be a, a, a conflict, she said, peace in the family, Nick. Peace in the family, that's the most important, peace in the family. So there was, and he held his, uh, his temper and his, his concerns and his frustrations. And, you know, it, it was difficult for him, extremely difficult for him, because, uh, my grand folks, you know, were pretty well off. They even had a chauffeur, a full-time chauffeur in, in a Cadillac. And my dad, <laughs> my dad used to say, my wife, my mother's name was Ella. Ella, whatever you do, I'll pay for the taxi cab, but don't pull up to the doctor's office in a chauffeur-driven Cadillac. It's just so hard on my bank account because I get all, I, I, I feel as if they're charging me like I could afford a Cadillac and, and a chauffeur. And, uh, but there was some, uh, one job I had with National Gypsum Company, I can remember, uh, I worked in, in a cubicle in this huge, huge office. And, uh, you know, there was no partitions, there were just desks all the way. And more than once, uh, I, could, I can see it right now, Andy, the chauffeur, with his, he was, of course, uh, colored, and he had a, a chauffeur's uniform with the cap and the whole works. He would appear at the door, way, way over on the other side, and then walk through all of those people and come over and, and say, Master Waller, here's your lunch. You forgot it. <laughs> it used to embarrass the hell out of me. But anyway, he, uh, uh, so that's a little bit of the asides in terms of, uh, he had, a, my grandpa had a big place on, in Canada and uh, had a home in the, state, in the States too, of course. Mm -hmm. And went to Florida every winter and all the rest of it. And it was tough on my father, especially uh, he worked during the, during the Depression. They made malt liquor at that time during the Prohibition. And, uh, and so, uh, but my father worked as a truck driver. And, you know, he didn't fit in with the other truck drivers because he was relation. And he didn't fit in with the management because he was, didn't have the education. So it was a, a rather tense and difficult situation for him. And, I, and, and he'd come home sometimes pretty frustrated and, and, and tell my mother some story about something that happened that day. And I think the crooks of the thing was that one day they were, somebody was fooling around in the employee's locker room and uh, they threw a, uh, something up on top of the locker. They went after it and found a microphone up there. And it suddenly occurred to my dad that all of these guys were, were uh, suspecting that he was carrying stories back from the locker room to my uncles. He never carried a story back, but he got the cold shoulder for that, and they found the microphone, and each one of them went up and, and apologized to him. Mm -hmm. And they wrote him pretty hard. And then they had a brewmaster at that time who wasn't a re relative, but who was really on my dad's case. And, uh, and so one day dad comes home about one or two in the afternoon. And uh, we said, you know, I said to him, 
he was kind of upset. He went in the living room. I said, what's the matter, Dad? He says, oh, I just lost my temper and I punched the, <laughs> the brewmaster in the nose. And I cheered, my brothers cheered, and thank God we finally got one in. So anyway, that was uh, that, and uh, there's another aspect of my childhood that I, it affected me quite a bit, and that was my youngest brother was retarded. And it was, apparently it was caused by a birth injury. But when he was young, he used to have convulsions, and they finally got him under control but when he was an infant and all through his childhood, he would get these convulsions and my mother would take and put him in warm water in the bathtub, but he, you know, jerking uh, uh, involuntarily. And that was traumatic for me. It was very sure. traumatic just to see him uh, do that. As a matter of fact, the day I left for the service, he, when I left the house, when I was saying goodbye to my mother, he had a convulsion, and he was in a convulsion when I left the house because I had to get to the bus. Hmm. And uh, it made quite a deep impression on me. It wound up that uh, when my mother was, when my father had passed away, my mother was uh, uh, in a nursing home, or went to a nursing home. Uh, my younger brother came out here, and as a matter of fact, he, uh, he wound up in Windsor, uh, at the nursing home in Windsor and lived there for several years uh, before he passed away. But uh, anyway, it was a big influence in my sure. life. Sure, yeah. sure. So that's, uh, that sort of wraps up the high points. So you think uh, uh, you got a college education. Do you think uh, your, your dad's experience played a part in and, and education oh, being a very important aspect to him? I no question about it. Yeah. My mother used to uh, just, you know, stuff away little money here and there because, of course, all that education was private, private education that had a, right. a tuition yeah. to it. And uh, in high school, I worked in the cafeteria. And uh, I suffered a little bit of what my, I felt my dad was going through when I, because you know, boys will be boys, and it was an all-boys school. And when uh, some of the guys would come through the line, they'd say, give me a little more knave, and you could call me knave, you know. And I remember there was a storage underneath, uh, I don't know, it was, it was sort of a underneath something else, uh, uh, alongside of the serving area or the kitchen area. And uh, you had to crawl under there uh, to get things out. And there's ventilation, big, uh, big uh, ven uh, uh, lath ventilation. And I don't know if, oh, uh, I don't know whether they, is one of the, the, the leader of, the, of, this, of this critical group, <laughs> whether he called to me or I called to him. But anyway, I realized that he was just outside of the, the grate. I know this thing had a fan too, a, a big fan. And <laughs> I remember him coming over and saying, Nave, aren't they going to let you out on the floor today? Nave, you're going to have to stay there. And there was this open flower. And I took a big handful of flour and I threw it into the fan. And he was white from head to foot. And that was the sort of thing that, <coughs> excuse me, that I was able to, uh, to, to uh, survive. I, I, I felt as if I had a little bit of what my dad uh, went through. Sure, sure. But to answer your question, he definitely had an influence, and, and I worked in the cafeteria to earn my way and, and as much as I could, mm -hmm. and my mother saved and scrimped because we didn't get anything special uh, from, my, from my grand folks except probably a, a break in the rent and stuff like that, I, you know, things I didn't even pay much attention to. But we led, lived a pretty pretty normal life and a, a reasonably austere life. Yeah, okay. But uh, it was tough to go over to my grandpa's big uh, place in Canada when there was family reunions. My cousins were there and my uncles were there and and uh, it was just, uh, it was always a, a, a stressful time for, mm, for us. Well. But my mother was, you know, she peace in the family and, and, and uh, 
he preached that, and the only time my dad violated that was when he punched the brewmaster, <laughs> which we thought was great. That was great. Yeah. So uh, anyway, to answer your question, okay. we I definitely had an influence, and then, and it was a great motivation for for us kids. You know, we certainly wanted to. Although my uncles never never uh, listened to me, I I went to a school in Milwaukee at Marquette. Of course, Milwaukee's a big beer town. Mm -hmm. And I saw, I went and went through Miller's and, and, and a few of the breweries up there, and I saw how much more automation they had than what Steinsbury had in Buffalo. And I can, when I was back on a visit, I visited with my uncles a lot. I said, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to organize, mechanize, or you're going to be, you know, the hell it's Nick's son, what, what would he know? And uh, so they finally, they finally went out of business. They had a, a brewery in Akron, Ohio, buy them out and tear it down. Huh. And that was after my grandpa died. But it was a, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. So uh, you graduated from Marquette. Uh, what did you uh, do after uh, after college? Well, I <clears throat> my my college uh, career was interrupted by the war. Okay, and so I guess that would ask, uh, would be my next question. Then, do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I I do. I was uh, visiting my closest friend who was killed in the war. He was a gunner and he was shot down over uh, Italy. But anyway, I was at his house on a Sunday morning, and uh, I heard it on the radio, and. Uh, that's a guy can remember it like it was yesterday, and so he and all of my buddies uh, were, were uh, signing up, volunteering, and most of them wanted to be in the Air Force, and so did I. I was, and so the recruiter that I uh, talked to uh, said uh, that uh, your best chance of getting in the Air Force is as a volunteer. In, in enlistment, I mean, not enlistment, uh, induction. Uh, you know, we were, we were subscribed, uh, there was a subscription. I mean, mm -hmm. you had to go in the service. Yeah. But you could request induction. And, and, and you, he, he, they said you'd have a better chance in the Air Force. Well, now, I did. Now, uh, getting into the Air Force with the hopes of flying or? Yes. What? Okay. Yes, that was my yeah. goal. Now, at the time, you were still only 17, though. Would you, you would have had no, to. No, no. This is you're talking about later on when yeah. you're. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I started Canisius College and uh, I had some jobs. And so I don't know exactly the timeline, but yeah, I, wasn't, I was too young after, after high school. Mm -hmm. So I started uh, Canisius College and then I enlisted, I mean, I uh, requested an induction. And I went into service after only. Uh, I think I only had two semesters at Canisius College when I uh, and went in the service. So you're looking at what the spring of '42 then is when uh... I went into the service in March of '43. Okay, okay, and uh, went to, from uh, Buffalo, uh, as I mentioned. The, the morning I left was somewhat traumatic, but then I went down to. Uh, uh, Niagara, uh, Fort Niagara at first. Now, and, did, now, you had mentioned buddies. Did you guys go together or were you no, by yourself? No, okay. No. We had, they all, we all started, went our own way. Okay. And, uh, and any, uh, anyway, a little aside there, uh, I, you know, took my pajamas with me and, uh, and all, and, uh, and it was a rude awakening the first morning when, and when I was the only one wearing pajamas, everybody else was just had their skivvies on. And so I shipped my pajamas home the very next day. The second rude awakening was that I woke up uh, to uh, 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 Reveille and, uh, you know, the sergeant comes in and flips the lights on and say, okay, 15 minutes, you fall out. And so, uh, you know, 15 minutes, I was still sitting on my bed trying to get awake. And so the first morning I fell out with the, with the uh, overcoat over 
hardcore my skivvies and uh, slipped into my shoes, not laced or anything else. I mean, that's as far as I could get. I mean, the time was up. And it's just amazing, you know, you th and I'm thinking. And I thought this so many times during the service, uh, during my time in service that, uh, uh, you know, this is impossible. I, just, I don't know, they're, they're, they're just ask them, this is crazy. They're not going to get me to do that. And the, one of the first ones was this early, <laughs> short period between the time I was called and I kind of had to fall out. And it's amazing how you evolve and learn and how they train you because I wound up to where I could get dressed, you know, get up, brush my teeth, go to the bathroom, get dressed, and make my bed before, before I went out. I, and, uh, you know, it was just such an evolution. Okay. And that sort of thing happened considerably so many times during my, my Army career where, uh, and I was fairly vocal about it, you know, I had a couple of, of, uh, of uh, what do I want to say, uh, opinions that, uh, that I shared with my buddies that they probably didn't have or didn't feel as strongly about. One was that I, I, uh, I thought the Army several times during my Army career, I felt that the Army was going about this all wrong. Oh, there was a better way to do this. And the other thing was that I was dedicated when I went overseas, that I was coming back. That was wow. my top priority, that I was going to come back in one piece. Yeah. And so uh, anyway, after basic training, I went, uh, I, I went to uh, instrument repair school. They did some tests on me and so forth and so on. Now, was that by choice or just by your testing scores? By my testing scores. Okay. I, I, didn't, I wasn't even aware of instrument yeah. repair at the time. But I wound up uh, after basic training in a <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> medium maintenance company. A, uh, it was a company that was attached to a, uh, a division in an army, but it was a, a service company that in a medium maintenance company, you had uh, three platoons. One was an automotive platoon, one was an artillery, and the other one was a small arms. And in the small arms platoon, there was a squad that was instrument okay. repair. Uh, the uh, medium maintenance company, as I mentioned, had, uh, had three, uh, three components, and I was in uh, instrument repair, and they just assigned me to that. In an instant repair, uh, it was just a, a, a squad in, the, in, that, in that particular platoon. And uh, what we did was we inspected and repaired all sorts of instruments from binoculars to BC telescopes to range finders to all that sort of thing, including watches. I, we, Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you, now, are you in the regular Army at this point, or yeah, are you in the Air no, Corps? No, no, I never did get into the Air Corps. Oh, you didn't? Okay. No, they, uh, they uh, disqualified me because of my eyes. Okay. My sight was, uh, wouldn't, I couldn't qualify. Okay. So that's when they put me in this other thing. And uh, uh, so I went to, after basic training, I went to Aberdeen Proving Grounds and took a eight-week course there in... Uh, in instrument repair, in watch repair, and stuff like that. And uh, then came back and we trained until we went overseas. And uh, is, is it something that you enjoyed doing? Oh yeah, okay. yeah, I, I, it was really, turned out to be a, a really, uh, I really felt very, very fortunate about my, my Army career uh, because there are very few people that can observe uh, the conflict and not be a combatant. No, okay, yeah. Uh, probably uh, correspondents can do that, but uh, I, uh, this particular segment, uh, section of the Army allowed me to be an observer, and I had a lot of experiences uh, where I was observing con combat but not participating. And I felt fortunate about that. And of course, it went along with my major principle of coming back alive. Yeah, fair so, enough. Yeah, yeah. So, I, uh, uh, so that was a, 
it was an interesting career in the service. Uh, I feel very fortunate. I had some narrow escapes, and uh, but I survived them all. With, Which we'll get into here yeah. uh, further in your story. So, yeah. so you uh, went through the schooling, and you said you're getting ready to ship off overseas. Did you guys know where you were going? Uh, well, all we it, knew is uh, we all we knew was that uh, we went out of uh, New, New Jersey, I think it was, and we were uh, we went and landed in. Marseille, France. And to answer your question, no, we didn't. We yeah. didn't know where the heck. We know we were going to Europe, of course, but that's about as close as we yeah, came. Yeah. Well, now here, uh, we. I don't want to skip over a good chunk of this story. Here, here's a boy from upstate New York going to sea. How was uh, How was that for you? Did you get your sea legs, or how was that that crossing for you? <laughs> it's funny that you should ask because. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I always challenged the Army's wisdom. And you know, we went over on the Mariposa. The Mariposa was a luxury ship out of the Matson line, and it was converted for troop transport. And as you can expect, they took the ballroom and they turned that into a major dormitory. I mean, there was three bunks high all over that. All over that, uh, and this, so my first general objection, which I didn't make a secret of to my buddies, was that we were traveling without a convoy. And I thought, that oh, wow. absolutely a mistake. Yeah. And of course, the rationale was that we're faster than subs. And of course, I presented the point of view that you've got a sub sitting out here waiting for you to go by. And, and I don't care how fast you are, this is not a good plan. But anyway, that's the way we went over. We went over alone and just our ship, which of course wound my clock pretty tight, just uh, just a trip over there. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. And uh, I can remember one incident on the way, or a couple of incidents on the way over, and they sort of tie in together. I went went down to the to the John during the night one night, and apparently the guy that I ran into in the John realized that I was pretty apprehensive. So he, uh, I say, well, you know, I, it's just a scuttlebutt, but I heard there's a, there's a Jerry sub uh, waiting for us up front. And, you know, I don't know, tonight, maybe it's tomorrow night, but we're gonna get nailed. He says, we're gonna get nailed. So anyway, that was pretty much primary in my mind. And uh, the next day, I'm laying in my bunk and I dozed off sleeping. I had the second bunk of a three-tier bunk. And suddenly, I hear machine gun fire. And I thought, oh, this is it. This is it. And so I jumped out of my bunk, ran down the full length of that corridor, and there was a window at the end, and dove out the window, and it was target practice. <laughs> and and they, all, they, they all gave me a hard time over that. And then I got the, uh, the reputation of being, you know, the first one in the foxhole, and I could read Gone with the Wind before anybody else arrived. I was, you know, quick on the trigger. I, mean, I was hyper sensitive to, to, I was scared, I guess. Yeah, fair enough, right. yeah. 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 So anyway, that was uh, the highlight of my trip over. We landed in Marseille, France, and that was uh, about, uh, uh, let me see. November of 1944 was, was when we arrived in France. And uh, the, uh, we had, of course, gone through Italy and were working our way up. And of course, they're working their way in from, from uh, the, the Normandy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember the first night off of the ship. Oh, I, I have to go back and tell you one little side. We had to pack up to go overseas, and uh, and we had this beautiful instrument repair truck. I mean, this truck was equipped like, you know, like you can't believe. We had a Swiss lathe that could cut a one, an 80 thread. That's the screw that fits in your glasses, but you could cut that thread on this lathe. It was a Beautiful, beautiful lathe. Anyway, our instant repair truck 
was air conditioned, and not air conditioned, but it was uh, filtered air, and uh, and it had heat in it, and it was a beautiful truck. And we had to pack it up to go overseas, and in packing it up, we had to take all the metal and and put cosmoline on it so that it wouldn't rust and and so forth. And right there, I sensed an opportunity, so I got an army cot. And I got, I went into town and got the most expensive bedroll I could find. And the bedroll just happened to fit in the duffel bag. So I had a duffel bag for my bedroll and I had an army cot with, and I took a handle off of a tripod, an army tripod, and put it on the, uh, uh, the army cot so I could, I had a handle I could carry that. <laughs> and so I put that in the truck before it left and so that was, that was, Sit wet, waiting for me when I got to Marseille, but of course we couldn't get the, the equipment right away. And I remember marching out of the port of, of Mar Marseille, up up a hill, up until up on a, a hillside, and there was maybe four or five miles out of Marseille. And I remember my first night there. First of all, Marseille was being bombed, and we could watch that. And uh, this is part of this being in a position to observe and not be involved. But uh, uh, the thing that I remember about it, and it took me years later before I pieced it together, I, I you know, we had uh, shelter halves, but we didn't use them at that time. Well, I can remember laying out under the stars, having two blankets, and that was all. And I was colder than hell. And, I started to shiver, and I was shivering so bad that my muscles ached. And of course, it was hyperthermia, but I didn't know that I didn't know the name. And I spent the night doing hyperthermia things, and uh, and it was the worst night in my life I can imagine. And uh, so anyway, uh, that was uh, that was my introduction to France. I, I, I listened to the bombing and and. Mm. and, and so then we went up from uh, Marseille up into France and then over into Austria and into Germany. Now, were you attached to, uh, was your unit attached to, who, I guess, give, can you give me your unit information? Well, yeah, this is, this is uh, uh, the, you know, they didn't tell us <laughs> doughboys much of anything, but the closest I could figure, all they kept saying is, you're attached to the 7th Army. Now, we must have been attached to something <laughs> more divisible in yeah. the seventh yeah. army, but that's about all I knew and I knew and the other thing that became quite obvious is that we serviced troops on the front line and that was the interesting part about it. Usually they tried to have two units up on the line and one unit in reserve or one company. It was two companies on the line and one company in reserve. And I was one member of a three-member inspection team once we got our truck and got rolling on this thing. And, uh, and so uh, we would go, uh, uh, we would inspect all of the uh, small arms art uh, and uh, artillery and, and it was in my little inspection team. And uh, if we found a default in any of that equipment, we would exchange it, and then we had a runner who would come up and pick up all of the defective stuff and bring it back to the company, which was 30, 40 miles, 30 miles behind the lines is where our company sat up and did all the repair work, the automotive work and all that work. But I was on a, an advanced inspection team, and I got a chance to, to see a lot of, of things happening up on the, in the front lines that, uh, you know, it's a very rare opportunity. And uh, I've got all kinds of stories about that. But anyway, just to give you a general overview, uh, we, uh, we went to, uh, oh, I have one more little, little anecdote about when we first went, to, uh, when we first got over there. They didn't issue ammunition to us, except when we were on guard duty. And so I, uh, I took my turn on guard duty, and the, and the, the routine was that the person who was on guard duty cleaned all of the carbines, 
we all carried carbines. And so there was a bench in this instrument repair truck, and I laid uh, the, uh, the carbines at a 45 degree angle on the bench. And uh, the object was to run a patch through, was to, first of all, open up the bolt, run a patch through the barrel with, with a little uh, 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 gun oil on it, and, uh, and then snap the bolt home and pull the trigger. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and that was the whole idea, is, it, is clean all the gun. And this is a, an interesting thing that I, uh, I re remember starting out at one end and uh, doing my thing. And after one or two, uh, the, the barrel of the gun was heading right for my gut, right for my gut. And after a couple of, uh, of uh, guns where I pulled the trigger and I thought, you know, this is stupid. <laughs> this, could, this could be bad if there was a bullet in there. So on the next one, I still, uh, I've got an explain, uh, theory for this, but I, uh, it's, uh, it's something that I, uh, uh, anyway. Uh, all right. So, uh, so anyway, uh, on the third or fourth gun, I reached up and it, the thought occurred to me that this is kind of stupid to, to uh, pull the trigger on the thing. So I didn't, I didn't know what I did was, I just sort of haphazardly leaned out of the way, you know, just, just cocked my hip over to the side. And by God, there was a round in there. And believe it or not, that round, you know how the, we had patch pockets on the fatigues? That round went in the packet. I had an army sweater tucked into my jeans. That army cut, that bullet cut the, 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 uh, the yarn, came out of the back of the pocket, out through the door, went out the door, and never drew an ounce of blood. <laughs> And the interesting about that, I don't know what your religious orientations are, but uh, I'm a Catholic. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a letter from my mother, and my Aunt Sue uh, had finished a novena for my safety on the day that that happened. And, you know, uh, people can say what they want, but as far as I'm concerned, that was my own personal little miracle. Because, you know, why would I do at that particular time just... And I didn't, you know, make a big deal out of it, get way out of the way. I just, it was a thought, well, yeah, that's something silly. And I just pulled my hand. So anyway, that was one of my introductions to Europe I, while I was on guard duty. And we, and you know, that's before everybody got ammunition and we weren't used to it, having ammunition around. And <coughs> so... And then, uh, well, now when you were up on the inspection team, did you carry a, a, a sidearm? Did you have weapons with you when you were? I'm glad you mentioned that because, as a uh, as an instrument repairman, of course, I had access to all kinds of binoculars, and binoculars were great items for trading. And so I traded binoculars, and I wound up with, you know, again going back to my my whole idea of coming back alive. Uh, I had a Thompson submachine gun with, with the old, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Al Capone magazine for it. I don't know where the guy got it, but I traded him a pair of nice binoculars for that. I had the Thompson submachine gun. Of course, I had my, my carbine, but that was secondary. I never carried my carbine much after that. I had a, 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 a a, a shoulder holster with a, a French Musette, uh, 7.65 caliber French Musette, beautiful gun, in a shoulder holster. And then I had a Beretta that was about this big that you could get fit in your hand, the nicest little gun you ever want to see because it had a, a, a grip safety where you had to be gripping down on the grip to, for it to fire, even in that little gun. And so I had... Uh, that and I had the little Breda in my belt and uh, I'll tell you a quick aside. So I'm up there with the dog faces, you know, on the line and or just behind the line. And we're usually 
I bivouacked in a oh, bombed out house, maybe two, three walls in the house, something like that. And uh, so it comes time to, to settle down for the night, and here I come in with my bedroll <laughs> in, a in a duffel bag, carrying my little, uh, <laughs> and the doughboys had, you know, two blankets tops, and they'd just crawl up in the corner and go to sleep that way. And I'd, uh, I'd unload my, uh, my uh, cot, you know, set up my cot. I'd put on my uh, bedroll. I'd slide in. I still had my shoulder holster. I'd, I'd sit up in my bed, put uh, around in the chamber, put the safety on, put the gun back and say, night. <laughs> and they, were, they were, you know, what's the matter with this guy? He thinks it's a Hilton. And so, and, and, you know, God bless those doughboys. They saved my bacon more than once. One time I can just offhand remember, I was in that situation and I had to go to relieve myself. So I, half asleep, half awake, staggered to the door and was going to go right off of the, the door. And uh, all of a sudden this hand comes over and, and covers my mouth and pulls me back. And just about that time, here comes a German patrol walking down the middle of the street. <laughs> and you know, they never saw us, we never said anything. <laughs> and uh, that was close. That was as close as it can be. So uh, I, uh, I got a lot of respect for the Doughboys. More than once, I'd be inspecting instruments, and, uh, and somebody, some Doughboy would take my account back of my head and slam me to the ground and fall on the ground, and there'd be an incoming uh, artillery shell. You know, I never heard it, I, you know, but he, you know, they sensed that after a while. They knew those, those kinds of things. And one other story, and then we'll move on, but I, one time, we were, uh, I heard through, uh, through the company that was in reserve that uh, there was a, an, oh, I know why I heard it, because they were uh, sitting around taking uh, the red-tipped uh, ammunition out of a machine gun belt, and they were tracers. And so they were eliminating, I says, what are you doing that for? And he says, well, we got a, a, a situation up on the line that's a little tricky. Trick, uh, tricky. Uh, there's a, uh, there is a, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, silo. Silo out in no man's land. And there was about three or four of our guys uh, pinned down in that silo. And we were going to send out a party to get them. And of course it was, the Jerry's were on the other side of the silo. And so, I thought, geez, this would be something really interesting to watch. He said, we, we, so we're going to be shooting through a blanket, and uh, we got to we rid of the the, uh, the tracers. So I thought, boy, this would be something to watch. So I went up with them on, on, in the in the uh, in the machine gun nest, and there they are shooting back and forth, and uh, dead dark as could be, you know. And of course, we've had our patrol crawling underneath the fire there at a bar so that the machine gun wouldn't go down any farther. And they were covering fire over and these guys were crawling underneath it. And all of a sudden, pew, we had, they'd missed a late, a, 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 what do I say, the tracer. Uh, oh. There was one that they had missed and it arced out there. And Man, oh man, they said, oh boy, we're in for it. And so I scrambled, I got, see, this is the, the being the, uh, the uh, observer thing. I scrambled out of there. I got out of there right then, right after that, that shell went out, that round went out. And so uh, it, one of the guys got killed. The, uh, the shell that machine gun nest and killed one of the guys and, and uh, hurt, seriously hurt the other guy. And of course, I'd have gotten in if I stayed yeah, there. Yeah, right. But uh, those are just some of the, I've got lots of stories like that, but I mean, you know, being an observer to the war and there's all I can. Well, when you first said uh, an observer to the war, I thought you were safely back, but you were in the thick of things. You weren't any, any well, less dangerous than a lot of the guys in the front line, though, really. Well, 
Yeah, not quite as much. So, you know, when things got hot, we had, we took our, our instant repair truck on some of these inspection things. <coughs> we always carried the grenade under the seat, under the front seat. And our instructions were if you, you know, have to abandon the truck, you throw that grenade in the back and blow the thing up. And uh, so that's, uh, that was the difference that, you know, the rest of them had to advance and fight and we could, we, we were ordered to retreat. And, uh, but I never looked at it like I was in combat because I never killed a, a soul. Yeah, right, yeah. I did kill one thing, though, <laughs> during the bulge. I, uh, I, we were over there during the bulge, and it was a pretty tight time, and they were conscripting our, our cooks and everybody else, and we were pretty bad. We spent two or three weeks. I'll never, I'll ne never ever have spam again because the only thing we found was a spam truck. And uh, I mean, a truck loaded with spam. We had it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it was, you know, they had to fish the spam out of, out of uh, that much uh, grease. Oh, geez, I got to this day, I can't stand spam. But anyway, uh, uh, well, I was, now I forgot what I was talking about. Well, uh, well, let's continue on with the bulge then. Um, you talked about the spam. Let's talk a little bit about the weather because that was uh, the coldest winter uh, Europe yeah. had gone through in, in like 50 some odd years. Yeah. What were what were conditions like for you? Oh, they well, they, they varied, you know, depending upon whether we were out on inspection or whether we were back with the company. But uh, it was uh, it was obviously cold. But we would we had stayed. I remember in Fusen, Germany. We stayed in a in a military compound that was Jerry compound, and we took it over. The interesting point about that is that I can remember going over the potholes in the road were terrible. At this intersection, outside of this compound, was a pothole that we kept going over, and one day, for whatever reason, they discovered there was an a nine millimeter artillery shell sitting in that pothole, and uh, if you ground it down far enough, it would it, 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 it trigger the cap and and uh, blow up the truck. But you know things like that, narrow escapes. Yeah, and, yeah. And <laughs> Most of the time, uh, you know, you were ignorant of the danger until it was over. But I've sat, I sat on the Maginot Line. You know the pillboxes. On the Maginot Line, I sat on top of the pillbox on the Maginot Line, watching our troops advance to a town, the next town. I mean, watching it like it was on a movie. I found out later there was Jerry's down in the pillbox. <laughs> so, you know, always stuff like that, you know. Just uh, uh, and then there's you know Bed Check Charlie, who was uh, they uh, they they had this night fighter that was. Would go around just looking for lights and strafing whatever he saw, and uh, I can remember one night I was on guard duty, and uh, she's coming down the, across the valley. There was a a truck coming down the hill with his lights on, and you know I could hear bed check Charlie, I could see the truck, and there's not a damn thing I could do about it. Yeah. And he nailed that truck just right on. Just never a chance. Probably the more humorous event. I mentioned that I never killed any anybody, but I did on guard duty one night during the bulge. You know they were they were switching uh, street signs and yeah, road right, signs yeah. and all that stuff. Dressing wearing, up as Americans. Yeah, and they were wearing our uniform and all that stuff, and we were changing passwords three four times a day, and. Uh, uh, I was on guard duty, and I had my Thompson submachine gun over my shoulder, and I heard a rustling, and so I gave the password, and I didn't get one back. And so I says, you know, who goes there? And I says, you know, I have live ammunition here, now you better tell me who's there. Not a sound, I mean, more rustling, that's all I heard, and I thought, God, somebody's sneaking up on us. And so finally, I, I, there's nothing else I could do. I took the Sid Thompson submachine gun and sprayed where the noise was coming from. And, all, and, ooh, 
<laughs> I'd kill the cow. <laughs> I, I just, uh, I just nailed the cow real good, and I never. We had a good feast out of that cow, but I never. They didn't never let me forget the time <laughs> I killed the cow. <laughs> but that was my uh, my only score in that regard. So, you know, that's kind of the way things went over there. Oh, one other, and then I'll stop on these anecdotes. No, no, please them. offer as many as you, you uh, want. Yeah. Well, there was a time I was inspecting uh, BC telescopes on artillery pieces. And this was up on the side of a hill. And all of a sudden, I see this P-51 fly over. And I thought, yeah, they gave him hell. That guy gave him hell. He's on his way back. Except that he came around and strafed us. And he pulled around and uh, he was a Jerry pilot in one of our P-51s. Yeah. He strafed the hell out of us and killed a couple of guys. And I'm up on the hillside and I'm running from foxhole to foxhole and they're all full. So I wound up on a 50 caliber, caliber machine gun and I'm pumping lead into this. I, I can see the, the, the Jerry's face now. He banking around and I could see he's looking over at me and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, I got him. I got. And of course, I wasn't trained for that yeah, yeah. and I didn't give him a lead. I uh, wasn't leading enough and it, they were all going be, behind him. I figured out later, but, uh, but that's the sort of, uh, you know, in contact with combat that I had yeah, it was, yeah. it was incidental and it was not constant and didn't have nearly as many of the, of the, I suffered more physical discomfort in the States than I ever did overseas. Is that right? Yeah. Huh. Because I was, there was always, you know, you could sleep in the truck, you could sleep in a barracks of, of uh, that we captured or there's other, but in the States we had a drill sergeant I mean, that was ruthless. I couldn't believe it, you know. It's, it's Saturday morning. We're supposed to go and leave in the afternoon, you know. He's got us in the morning. He says, now, what I want you to do, when I say scatter, I want you all to scatter. And when I say hit it, I want you to take a flying tackle at the ground, and I mean that's the way it's got to be. And it's raining like hell, and it's the fall of the year, and it's cold and rainy. And I can remember scatter, hit it, and you, you slide and the <laughs> mud covered. And then, you know, you're, you're covered with mud and you're cold as hell and you're wet. And he comes in and he, they, 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 he makes us see a film before we <laughs> do anything else, you know. That and a 30 mile hike, you know. Yeah. All these things I kept saying, I can't do it. I'm not gonna be able to do it. This isn't gonna be me. I'm not gonna do it. Or, or they're foolish. I can remember crossing, I don't know whether it was the Rhine or, or one of those rivers over there, we were crossing on a pontoon bridge. And I just, uh, I just absolutely disagreed with the Department of Defense there. Uh, because here were, it, was, it looked like, uh, like, like the biggest 4th of July you ever want to see. All of the, the uh, what, is, what I'm trying to say, the phosphorus shells, you know going off all these shells and they're shelling the hell out of this town and they're shelling, I don't know who's shelling who, but we're pouring into this town. And I'm thinking, you know, you got this little narrow bridge and you got all those guys over there and if we have to pull back, we're not going to be able to get back in it. And as I'm telling, them, you know, my buddy who's driving with me, I think, you know, this is stupid for crying out loud. Secure the place and then let's go over there. No, we got to pile in over there when it's all hot like that, and that's the kind of that's the kind of things that that I uh, I just definitely disagreed with the War Department. Yeah. <coughs> but we won the war, so I guess I wasn't. They, they did something right anyway. <laughs> uh. Now along the way, uh, would you have inter any interaction with the local uh, the locals at all? Or? Uh, I must have, but I, I can't. I can't bring up much of that yeah. at all because, uh, oh, the the one of the things that I noticed is that when we 
shell the town, or when they shell the town in France. Well, by the time we went through, it was still, you know, dodging debris all the way through. In Germany, the minute the, the shelling ended and we went into the town, they, they, they were picking up sticks, they were cleaning up, and it was getting cleaner and cleaner. Which reminds me of another story. <clears throat> my grandfather, who I mentioned earlier, came from Würzburg. As a matter of fact, my grandmother did too, Würzburg, Germany. And there's a story about Würzburg during the war. The, uh, we, what was our custom, it was to phone in from the outskirts of town to the Burgermeister, the mayor of the town, and ask him if he'd like to surrender his town. If we did, we wouldn't, we wouldn't bomb it. We, I mean, we wouldn't shell it or anything. We'd go in. And uh, so they get to Würzburg and uh, call in, and the Burgermeister says, yeah, let's come in. We're surrendering. And as they started in, a sniper knocked out one of our guys, and it just teed off the, the commander so bad that he pulled back, and he says, I want you to line up your artillery, and I want you to start at the far end of that town and reduce your elevation a little bit and just keep shelling and shelling and shelling until there's nothing left of that town. The only thing that was left of the town was a monastery up on the hill. And he just, he just leveled the town. And he started at the far end and moved this way so that people didn't have much chance of even getting out of town. But he was going to make him pay for that. And, uh, and he did. And he did. Mm -hmm. I, never had, I never had the courage to tell my grandfather yeah. folks about that. Right, right. He did. Oh, wow. Did, did they ever talk to you after the war about, uh, I mean, being from Germany, what their thoughts were on the whole matter? Or I don't recall any specific conversations except one before the war, or maybe it was after the war, but uh, one comment my grandfather made, he says, you know, that's one of the reasons why I came in. We saw it coming. We saw this coming. Hmm. So apparently when Hitler got in, they got out. And that's uh, that's the only reference that I have my grandfather, hmm. my grandfather yeah. in, in Germany. But uh, we were in uh, in uh, Imst, Austria, when the war ended. And uh, and I, I remember that that's when uh, the European conflict ceased. And then there's a little anecdote about that that. I thought it was kind of interesting. After the uh, war ended, we set up a uh, big microphone, um, uh, uh, what do I want to say, uh, public address systems, and announced in German to the people, uh, to the hills around there, come, you know, surrender, uh, the, the war is over, come out of the hills, surrender. And <laughs> they come pouring out of those hills like you wouldn't believe. And I could hardly see the next guard. And I'm thinking, here are these guys, they still have their, <laughs> their guns. Somebody spreads a rumor that the war isn't over. <laughs> We're dead meat <laughs> because I could hardly see the next guard. And <laughs> we had all these people. And an interesting thing, 40 years later, yeah, 40 years after we were married, on our 40th wedding anniversary, we went back uh, to Europe, and, uh, and Imst is near where the uh, Ludwig's castles were. So we were traveling with another couple. Well, as a matter of fact, the Doherty's, and uh, Jim and, and Kathy Doherty. And we, we spent a month in Europe with them. And uh, so we're at... Uh, 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 near Imst, and I said, you know, that's where I was when the war ended, and I told him the story about the surrendering. And uh, so Jim says, well, why don't we just swing by there and see if you can remember, see anything. I says, I remember that valley like it was yesterday, beautiful valley. And uh, so he started pulling into the town. I says, you know, I don't have any recollection of the town. I don't know if they rebuilt the town, but this is all strange to me. And, and we went, drove through the town, 
And we come out the other end of the town and there was this valley and that, that was the valley that I was in. Apparently I never got into the Imst. Oh, okay. I just, it was in that valley. And, uh, and I, I mean, it just snapped in there. <laughs> and just a, a little aside, I was just so excited to see that valley that I, Jim stopped and pulled over the side of the road. And I says, I gotta take some pictures of this. So I got out and I ran across the road and up on a little bit of a hill. And, uh, and I was gonna take a, a couple of pictures of that valley. And I tripped and fell. And I, <laughs> I rolled down the hill and nobody in the car saw me, but I, I, took, I took quite a crash. And I got up and I went, you know, I'm okay, I'm okay. And they waved back <laughs> and they didn't know. I didn't even know I fell. But anyway, uh, that was an interesting experience. Was it? Was there quite a bit of celebration when V V E Day was announced? Not, yeah. not for us. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because you know we were, we were too busy mopping up. You know, mm. it didn't. Uh, we were glad the war was yeah. over yeah. and all, but I don't recall any celebration at mm. all. As a matter of fact, mm. uh, yeah, but. Uh, that, and you guys would stay on. You stayed on with the occupation forces then. Not for too long. Oh, okay. We, we pulled back, and went out of uh, La Harve, and came back to the states. And the only thing I remember about the trip back was that we got into the New York Harbor, and I saw the Statue of Liberty, and I've been sleeping out on deck in that that uh, bedroll that that, that, <laughs> that I had. And by this time, it was sort of all damp with uh, with uh, seawater and so forth and so on. I remember throwing it overboard really? in, in New York Harbor. Yeah. And that was the end of that. Now, was there any worry about you guys being transferred oh, to the Pacific? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was a great worry for me, as I was saying, you know, I'm dedicated to coming back. But I had a bad feeling about the Pacific, I thought. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Jerry's were rational people. I didn't feel the Japs were rational because there's all these kamikaze stuff. And so they didn't make any any uh, bones about the fact that uh, we were gonna be going in invading Japan and, uh, and it's gonna be a big deal. And we were in part of that invasion force and, uh, and we're sort of training down in Texas uh, I forget the name of the camp in Texas, but we were training down in Texas and it looked like it was about time for us to go. So we had a, I guess a two week leave before we'd have to pack up and go to uh, go to uh, Pacific. And I'm home on leave for BJD. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I was, I, and, I, and when I celebrated that one because I sweat that one out. I just felt I wasn't coming back off of that, out of that one. I just felt, my, you know, my whole approach to my family at that time was, you know, this is goodbye, you don't know it, but this is goodbye. And that's the way I felt. And uh, I did, never did have to have, uh, it never was a problem. It was, uh, it was all over and I went to, I guess went back to Camp Hood. It was at Camp Hood, Texas. And went back to Camp Hood and mustered out. And that's that ended my career. Now, how was that? Uh, uh, did you ever? Uh, we talked about your talking with your grand folks, your grandparents. But how was it? Uh, did your your folks, and particularly your mom, ever talk about what she was going through with you overseas? I mean, I know you were probably uh, censored. She really couldn't tell her where you were at, and and and, and such. Did uh, she ever talk about what she went through with with her uh, her son in harm's way? Well, she had. A lot on her mind, especially my brother, who was yeah, right. taking a lot of a. She, I, you know, she was absolutely thrilled when I got home. Every time I got home, and uh, but uh, I can't uh, just from general. Uh, she was pretty stoic in, no, yeah. in terms of because of, of the joke. German, yeah, and so. She didn't express much concern, but she sure expressed a lot of gratitude mm. when it was off and when I came home. Mm. I remember coming home the first Christmas I was in service. I came home for Christmas and I had to, from Camp Atterbury, Indiana, 
and I had to, uh, I, I slept in the baggage rack on, in the couch, and uh, I didn't tell her I was coming. And boy, that was a memorable occasion when I pressed the doorbell and she came and she nearly fainted because I was home for Christmas. Oh, wow. And, uh, wow. But that was a, uh, a mixed, no, that was a different time. I was thinking of a tragedy that happened when I was traveling in the States during those days. And, but I, uh, but it was a different, it was when I was in Camp Atterbury, Indiana. I struck up an acquaintance with a guy in Camp Atterbury and uh, he, uh, I guess I was going to Buffalo that time too. He, uh, 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 he says, now you know the trains here are going to be crowded as hell. Now, I got a system, and he says that uh, I'm going to share with you. He says you don't get in the crowd. They're all you know at the platform, trying to get on the train. You stand back until the car stops. And when this car stops, you move in right opposite the door and the pressure on each side, you just do a little forward pressure and it'll put you right in. And uh, so I'm ready to do that. And uh, I, as a matter of fact, I started my, my routine. But about that time, while it, I was lining up, when I was lining up, I heard uh, you know, a lot of noise and screaming. And one guy, because of the crowd pressing against the one guy was was doing this on the car trying to keep and he finally went under and was killed and boy that was the quietest train I've ever been on and we all felt terrible about the fact that he was pushed under the under the tracks on mm -hmm. under the coach mm -hmm. but uh, anyway it uh, the whole experience for me turned out to be pretty positive experience yeah. and my folks did were grateful my dad my mother is very very religious and uh, she bear you know burned the bearings out on her beads uh, and uh, I'm sure it had some effect on yeah. the outcome because I did I did come through it without a scratch yeah yeah so you, you, you must be out of the service. How was that transition? You said the transition going from civilian life to military life was pretty tough. How was it going from military back to civilian life after all you'd been through? Was it much yeah. of a transition for you? Well, I came out in the spring of the year and uh, it was, it, and so I gave myself a two or three month leave over the summer. And we had at that time uh, a cottage in Canada uh, up past the Welland Canal on the Canadian shore of Lake Erie. And so I went up to the cottage and uh, just, I can remember sitting out in the front looking at the lake and drinking milk. God, I couldn't get enough milk. Oh, did that taste delicious. And my dad used to do jewelry work. Uh, that was his, uh, his occupation before he became truck driver. And so he always kind of kept his hand in uh, doing a little stone setting. And he taught me how to set stones. And so I would sit in the, in the front porch of the cottage and, and, and set uh, stones. And uh, I can remember never in my life being in better condition because we were about, oh, maybe quarter to a half mile this is a bay and to the point, Rathman's Point it was called. And I can remember every morning my mother calling me, I'd get up and slip on my bathing suit and uh, walk out onto the dock and I'd just, you know, you know how you are when you're a young teenager, you sleep better than anything else. And I'd, I'd flop in the water and I'd lay on the bottom and I'd think, well, you know, you can't stay here all day. <laughs> you gotta breathe. You gotta do something. Get on it now, <laughs> do it. So I'd come up and take a breath and I'd swim down to the point. And then I'd, try, I'd, I'd run back and then I'd go up and we had a punching bag on the, on the, uh, the bank. And I'd, I'd hit the punching bag until my mother called me for breakfast. And I felt that was a great condition. I wow. felt, you know, I felt grateful for the fact that I came through the war. I felt grateful for the <laughs> milk. 
I just enjoyed that summer like you can't believe because it was was the end of uh, you know it was a good transition for me so I had a pretty pretty pleasant transition and it was nice to have a place to go back to. Well, you look back, you say you're grateful and, and it was a good experience for you. I mean, during the war, when you're in those very situations, I mean, as a teenager or young, in your tw 20s or whatever, you you feel invincible at that age. Yeah. But now that over the years, if you look back and, and, and revisit that and I thought, you know, I was in, in a pretty dire straits at times or I was in, in situations that uh, are, or is it, do you still feel the same as you did as that invincible 18, 19 year old. Guess, uh, the, the way to, to, to sum it up is that, in one word, grateful. Yeah. I was grateful that uh, I didn't have to kill. You're right. Yeah. And I was grateful that I had. But you could have been killed, is what I'm saying. I mean, I, I, I've never experienced battle. Uh, so I, I'm li listening to you tell these stories, and, and, and it's just like, it was amazing some of the situations you were in. That, uh, yeah, and they, uh, but. Uh, I don't know. At the time, I was scared, and yet I wasn't scared. You know, the, the I had a, a, a pent up uh, uh, anxiety, uh, and I had trigger reflexes, but I didn't dwell on it. And you mm. know, it was just a, it was there, and it was gone. It was, you know, that was then gone. But uh, and I was. And I, you know, I saw enough. I've seen sentries laying dead at their posts, and I've seen all sorts of things that uh, that made me very aware of the, of the dangers of war. But I never felt. I felt apprehensive, and I don't know. Maybe that's another word for scared. But uh, uh, but I, it didn't. It didn't, I didn't dwell on it. I, it just well, I dwelled on the, the the good fortune is what I dwelled on. I really did. I, I always felt pretty damn lucky. And two, I don't want to minimize the, the the fact or the thing that I said earlier. I was convinced that I was going to come back from Europe. I mean, I was convinced of that, and uh, I was going to do everything I could to come back in one piece. I didn't have any any near that kind of feeling about Japan. Yeah, isn't that something? Yeah. Well, you, you've mentioned a number of times that you're a re religious man. Do you think your, your faith played a part in that oh, as well? Oh, no question about yeah. it. Yeah. No question about it. Boy, that's where you're at. <laughs> you don't find any atheist up on the line. Yeah. <laughs> that's everybody. Everybody has a, seeks out their own, their own spiritual help, but uh, you betcha.